Hey everybody, welcome to my site. Dr. Jamil Sayaj here, transformation coach and naturopathic physician, and I wanna say welcome. Whether this is your first time seeing me or you followed me for some time, I'm truly honored for your presence and thank you for your time. Well, basically today, I wanted to give you some behind the scenes. I wanted to share with you my story. A lot of people have been asking me, you know, tell me what you're all about. Tell me your story. What's happened to you? What brought you to this point? And I figured I could write it or I could share it from the heart and I feel like that would serve a lot more. There's some lessons there that I can't wait to share with you. So for me, my story really started when I was 14 years old. I was this sick track athlete. I got into track and field, never really ran before a day in my life. And there I was running and I was getting sick all the time. My track performances were suffering and I was wondering why, why is this happening to me? All my friends, they're doing so well. I'm at practice too and I'm not getting the result. And then I figured, you know, maybe it has to do with my diet. Now, looking back after working with thousands of patients and clients, I've never seen anyone with the diet that I had. <laughs> and I'm sitting there thinking, all right, nutrition might be a part of this. So I cold turkey stopped going McDonald's or Burger King four or five times a week. I stopped drinking three liters of soda a day. I kept doing the box of double stuffed Oreos though for a couple of years, <laughs> gotta be honest with you. But I noticed that once I started making those changes, not only did I stop getting sick, but my track performances went through the roof. I also started drinking a gallon of water a day. And after cutting that soda, I felt just alive. And I figured there's gotta be so much more than just, I'm just skimming the surface. What else is there? And so I started looking into the other areas of a truly fulfilling life. I started looking into relationships. I started studying from some of the, from some of the top dating coaches and marriage counselors and therapists in the world and learning what makes relationships tick. How do they last? How do, what's that spark and how do you keep it alive? I started looking into motivation and persuasion and metaphysics, spirituality, and just devouring anything I possibly could. And from 14 to 19, I put well over 10,000 hours in from live events, from mentors, from YouTube, from books, anything I could get my hands on. And I was so fortunate to have the experiences that I had where I was able to work with people to improve their health and their relationships, just give them a boost, help them feel unstuck in their life. And it was so gratifying for me to help in that way. And then when I was 19 years old, that's when my life changed. That was the most profound thing I've ever experienced. I'm 19, I'm in my sophomore year of undergraduate in the Bronx, New York, Fordham University, and it's a Thursday, and I'm planning at this point to go to this pre-med uh, group that I'm a part of. We're supposed to go to Albany, which is the capital, so we can basically fight to keep our funding, because every year they might cut it. And they said, hey, you're one of the students, you're doing really well with the program, can you come in, and can you just share your experience, help us keep our funding? I said, yeah, no problem, absolutely. Thursday night rolls around, and we're supposed to be there from Friday to Sunday evening. And when Thursday night comes around, I get this feeling just deep in me, saying, don't go. Something in me just really strongly urging me, it's not right, something's wrong. And I'm thinking, well, I already told them I was gonna go. I sat with it for an hour, two hours, three hours, and it was such a strong feeling. I thought, I have to listen to this. And so I emailed them, I said, you know what? Something's not right. Um, Something came up, rather, <laughs> and I, I can't make it. So the, the weekend was pretty uneventful until Sunday. Sunday morning, I wake up, and I go downstairs to the kitchen and get a glass of water, and my mom is knocking on the bathroom door downstairs to check on my dad. And to give you some context, this is a man who was 49 years old. He had two heart attacks in his 30s, and he was also a smoker since he was an early teenager. High stressful kind of life, and we were always worried about him when it comes to his health. And so he's in the bathroom, she knocks on the door, he's been in there for a while just to make sure he's okay. And this happens fairly often, so I didn't think much of it. Then she knocks again, and I hear that. Then she knocks a third time. So I start walking downstairs to see, is everything okay, what's going on? And she's hitting this door really hard. And I come up and I start slamming this door, yelling his name, and he's not answering. There was a moment of panic followed by just this knowing of what to do. And I ran to the bathroom window on the outside of the house and I tried to open it and I couldn't get it. I ran back inside and just pure adrenaline, I broke the door. There was my dad laying on the floor, unconscious. We called 911 and next thing I know, we're in the hospital. And my sister is crying, my mom's trying to comfort her, but she's trying to hold it together herself. And there I am trying to be strong for both of them telling them it's gonna be okay. 
and my dad was in a four hour brain surgery and I had all these doctors, I guess trying to, coming from a good place, trying to warn me, prepare me. They were telling me very, very likely he wasn't gonna survive, but they were just telling me. And there I was trying to be comforting to my loved ones. And after the four hour brain surgery, the neurosurgeon came out and told us that it was the worst brain aneurysm he'd ever seen, it ruptured. And going into the surgery, he would have put his odds at surviving at about 5%. If he did survive, we were told he was going to be a vegetable, he wouldn't ever be the same. And this obviously isn't what you want to hear. And so the brain surgery ends, the surgeon comes out and tells us he survived. I walk into the room post-surgery and I see my father, this man who is this epitome for strength for me. He was this role model of what a good man is. And he's laying on this bed with half of his skull is removed head was wrapped because of the pressure in the brain. He had a trach coming out of his neck. He had so many IVs and wires coming out, machines everywhere, and I have never seen anybody that vulnerable. He was in a coma, and I remember this was the day before final exam week, and I had five finals over the next three days, and my head, as you can imagine, was not there. We were told he was in the critical stages. He could die at any time, and I would get to school, take the exam as quick as possible, and get out of there. And I remember on Wednesday, I'm in a physics exam, already wasn't one of my strongest suits, and I get this phone in my backpack ringing on vibrate 10, 20 times, and I'm thinking, all right, he died, it must have happened. And now I'm, I can't take this exam, I just went through the Scantron as quick as possible, didn't even look at the test, turned it in, go outside, it's my sister, I give her a call, she wants the Wi-Fi password. You can imagine how I was feeling in that moment. But I figured, let me drop it, let me get to the hospital as quickly as possible. I get there and just all day, just watching this man unconscious, holding his hand, speaking to him, and just trying to pray as hard as possible, trying to give him as much energy as I could, speak to him, hoping maybe he could hear something. And over the course of the next few months, he was in outpatient facilities. This happened in April, now we're in September. And he's in these outpatient therapies and he's not living at home and we're traveling to see him and we only get about an hour roughly every time because I have to drive home, I have to drive to the place, rush hour traffic, we finally get there. And when we do get there, visiting hours end in 40 minutes to an hour. And I remember my family was absolutely incredible. I come from a very large family, my dad's one of eight kids, many cousins, and each of those kids have six to eight kids. So you can imagine our parties, two, three hundred people, I have 40 to 50 first cousins, and they were absolutely angels. Somebody was always with my dad, pushing him, making him stronger, always going a little bit further than the doctors advised, but they were doctors themselves, so they were like, we'll handle this. And over those several months, dad started walking, started whispering. He would talk like this all the time. And all the doctors would check his vocal cords and they'd say, everything was fine. We don't understand why he's not speaking. And it made it even worse because my dad was a singer. And he was one of, on top of being a family practice physician, he was actually one of the top um, Elvis impersonators in the world. Music was his passion. He was a drummer ever since he was a kid. He was all county, all state in high school, and music was his life. And to have someone whose voice was that pivotal, of, it was that crucial of an aspect of who they were, that to lose that, it seemed unbearable. And so we were always getting frustrated by the whispering. We really wanted that voice to come out. And I remember he started doing so much better. He was walking. He had some short-term memory loss. And that definitely pushed my patience. That definitely tested me. Here was this man that we loved so dearly, and we would try to do so many beautiful things for him. And he wouldn't remember that we did them an hour later, 10 minutes later. And it was just frustrating, because it was a constant reminder that life was different. And I remember this my happiest memory. I walk into his room, it's 8 o'clock p.m., visiting hours end at 9, my mom's in there, and they're about to get ready to watch this TV show, and it's a show called Wipeout, if you ever heard of it. And it's one of those game shows where contestants will run across this obstacle course, and it's designed for them to fall into wa in, in the water, and it's just supposed to be funny. And my dad got a kick out of it, so we always played it for him, made him laugh. And this one time, there we are, we're all laying in the hospital bed, my dad's right here, my mom and I are like sandwiching him, and this guy is going through the course and he's going all in and he falls and it's, it's real, it's actually pretty funny. And when he falls, my dad starts laughing and his voice came out. 
and immediately my mom and I and him were laughing and crying at the same time. We're so overwhelmed with joy. And I was able to convince the nurses to let me spend the night, even though that was against the rules. And I remember my dad's hospital bed, I'm as close as I could possibly be to it. And throughout the night waking up every time a nurse came in to check on him, and him and I just making eye contact and him speaking to me, thanking me for being there. And it was just such a overwhelming state of just joy and bliss and peace, but also chaos. And I really wasn't sure what was going on, but I was just on that roller coaster. I was on that wave. I was riding it. And I remember my dad came home around October, November. And you take for granted, usually, all the amenities the hospital has, the services they offer, until you don't have them. And there I am at home trying to help my mom take care of my dad when there were so many things he needed, so much extra help he needed that we didn't have. And I remember, oh man, I remember feeling so blessed at the same time, so stressed. It was a living hell essentially for the first year and a half. I want you to imagine this, almost 500 days of my life. I would go to bed every night wondering if that was the last time I was gonna see my dad. I'd wake up every morning for a few moments wondering if that was all a dream. If I would walk downstairs and there he'd be reading his newspaper, drinking his coffee, just about to go to work, everything would be normal. And then I'd walk downstairs and he'd be there, but it wouldn't be normal. And I realized slowly but surely that this is life now and life is different. And I remember my mom and I were his primary caregiver, givers. And now it's my junior year of college, and I was, pre I was pre med. Most students my age at that time were getting ready to go to medical school. They were taking their MCATs, which is that entrance, entrance exam for medical school. And I knew that my sister was just going off to college. My mom would have been alone if I left, that dad wasn't ready. Mom couldn't handle him right now on his own. She needed help. So I took a year off. And in that year, I started working at a family practice office nearby. And it was such an unbelievable learning experience. At that time, I'd already spent from 14 to 20, 21 at that time learning as much as I could about just health, not including all the other things I mentioned before. And I started seeing such amazing results. This doctor knew about it, and this doctor said, yeah, come on in. So one year, two years went by, and after two years, I'd been truly blessed. I was the medical assistant at that office. The doctor trained me in everything, and I had worked there at this point, I'd worked with thousands of patients, and it was such an amazing experience, and I knew that this was my calling. I knew that I loved people, I wanted to serve them. After three years, I figured, all right, Dad's starting to get better. And there was one thing I wanted to mention, actually, that it was actually very tough for me. One of the biggest tests for me of just patience and just, you, when you give your heart to someone like I was doing for him, this was a man that I truly loved, I truly cared about. But when we were younger, we didn't really spend that kind of time with my dad. We were closer to my mom. My dad would always be working, and I was blessed that at night we'd have dinner together. But then I'd go upstairs, I'd do homework, I'd play a video game, I'd watch a movie, maybe I'd be with friends. And he would go downstairs, play some music, watch TV, whatever it was. We just didn't have that kind of relationship, which I find many people my age and younger, a lot of them have. But now the aneurysm happens and now I'm spending 14, 15, maybe even 16 hours a day with this man, taking him to physical therapy, working out with him, going for walks, singing, I sing, he sings, he plays the drums. And music was just such a pivotal part of that relationship. I remember his short-term memory loss was the part that was one of the most difficult. It was like being with somebody who has really late stage dementia. And I remember at one point he forgot who I was and it was like, my, my sense of self, the ground beneath me just went away, I felt shattered. I remember arguing with him that I wasn't his nephew. And it was such a painful moment. And there I was arguing with him when I know it's not his fault. I know that it's, it's, I can't blame him for that. And I remember experiencing so many wonderful moments, but also so many moments of just pain where I want my mom to just Go out, mom, go with your friends, go with, go with my grandma, go with somebody, go have fun. You've done so much. And there I am with my dad one-on-one, -on -one, and he starts having a seizure. And if you don't know, usually seizures are harmless, 20, 30 seconds usually. And if they don't fall and they don't bite their tongue or anything, they're usually okay. You just hold them, support them, make sure they don't hurt themselves. He'd have seizures that are one, two, even five minutes long. 
and the phone's across the room and he's a 215 pound guy and I'm holding him, trying to make sure he doesn't fall because he was standing up when he had it. And the amount of times that we had to call the ambulance, the amount of times we thought he was gonna die, it was like experiencing his death over and over and over and over again, especially for those, the first year and a half that I mentioned. Now fast forward to three years as I was getting at before, dad's starting to do much better using nutrition, using lifestyle, using a lot of psychology, I was able to use humor to kind of undo some of that short-term memory loss and turn short-term memory into long-term memory. And he was doing the best he'd ever done. He lost weight, he was off his medications, and it seemed like we were in the clear. It seemed like everything was going well. And up until that point, my plan was going to a traditional medical school and you know, I know that they don't really get much training in nutrition and behavioral therapies and lifestyle medicine and psychology. But at the same time, I was like, let me go learn the medicine in this school and then continue doing what I've been doing the last seven, eight years at that point. And then I discovered naturopathic medicine. And this was a field of medicine that if you don't know, it's really mind, body, spirit medicine. It's true healing. A naturopathic physician who's trained at one of the accredited medical schools in the United States, it's a four-year medical program. We learn everything that traditional medical doctors learn. But then we also learn all the holistic side of things, the acupuncture, the physical medicine, the chiropractic, the nutrition, and it's such, and the psychology, the mind-body, and it was my calling. It was like, that is it. That's what I've been looking for. And so now I'm like, well, maybe I'll be able to go. You know, dad's doing much better. I think mom's going to be able to handle him. And then I wake up one morning. It's Mother's Day. And I woke up to my mother screaming my name. And it was like a horror movie. I'd never heard a sound like that, this high-pitched shriek. And it was like a part of me knew. I shot out of bed, still mostly asleep. And my parents' room is on the right, and I went left. And I ran down the stairs to the kitchen to get the phone, not even knowing, no thought what was even happening. I almost fell down the stairs, called 911. I just told them I know exactly what's going on. I ran upstairs. My dad's on the floor. No heartbeat, not breathing. Mom's doing CPR on him. I start. Next thing I know, fire department's there. They're working on him. And there it is. I'm watching him, all these guys shocking him, CPR. And, you know, a big part of me is staring at him, just going, come on, Dad. Come on, Dad. You got it. You got it. And there's another part of me that was in this strange state of peace that I hadn't known that it's okay, that this is, you know, it's a part of life. And I remember going, the ambulance took my dad, and we were going to follow. And we got the house ready real quick. My mom and my sister are in the car. I'm at the front door locking the door. And my phone rings. And it's my uncle. And I answer the phone, and I say, hello. And he tells me he didn't make it. And I can hear that he was holding tears back. And I said, I'll see you soon. And he hangs up. Now, here I am. My mom saw me on the phone. And I'm sitting there going, I have to tell her this now. And there's a part of me that thought, well, maybe I can hold it back. Maybe we'll get there and then she'll find out. And it didn't feel right. It was like, that's not fair. And I get in the car and I remember I look at her. She looks at me and she says, who called? And I had to tell her that he didn't make it. And I remember seeing her face just shift. I, the hardest thing I've ever done. I've never seen something like that. And she says, holding back tears, all right, let's just go. Let's just get there. We get to the hospital, and the family's there. Everyone's crying. The body's cold. And my mom, my sister, and I, we all just had a massive emotional release over the body. And I remember being at his wake a couple days later. It was open casket, five hours. I stood by that casket the whole five hours to make sure that I could appreciate and thank everybody that came to pay respects. And over 7,000 people came. Keep in mind, he was 53 years old when he passed, and seven, over 7,000 people showed up, and we were told he broke every record they had. And no exaggeration, 95% of those people walked up to me, shook my hand, and in the eight to 10 seconds they had with me, they said, your dad saved my life. And not only was that humbling enough right there, all these people coming up from different religions, different cultures, asking if they can pray over the casket in their own way to see the effect, the impact this man had. That taught me to stop playing small, to share your gifts because this world needs you to shine the unique light that you have. There's darkness out there, you can light it up. And I remember, 
And I remember one of the deepest, most profound lessons that my dad taught me in those three years was perspective. You know, everyone lives as if they're never going to die, and then they die having never really lived. We all live, we all live like we're going to make it to 100. We procrastinate on our dreams and goals. We hold it back. We say, tomorrow I'll do it. I'll tell that person how I feel about them at some point. I'll, that job I want to start, that career that I want to begin, the business, eventually I'll do it. And we let fear run the show instead of living by faith. And my dad taught me this perspective just through his actions, through every night before he went to bed, he would tell me, watch over your mother and your sister. Don't let anybody mess with you. <laughs> that was always what he told me. I remember that. And I remember just allowing this acceptance of what was to be my driver of peace. I remember after he passed away, looking back at the three years, and in those three years, two of my cousins passed away. One was 20 and one was 21. And you know, it's hard enough as it is, but to see how different people processed it and to see that there was a lot of suppression going on. You know, we all process in our own way. But to me, I didn't want to suppress it. I wanted to get to a place of peace. I didn't want to, 10 years later, still feel just as heartbroken. And so I took it on myself to look at his pictures, listen to his songs that he would sing that I had on my computer, watch videos. And every single night, I would cry myself to sleep. But after three weeks, something clicked. After three weeks, I had this like an awakening. I had this epiphany, this overwhelming sense of peace just rush through me. And I started seeing life for what it was. I started seeing life every moment for the miracle that it is, for the once in a lifetime opportunity that it is. For all the people in my life, I stopped taking them for granted. I started just living every day like it's my last. You know, Steve Jobs has this, had this quote where he said, if you live every day like it's your last, one day you will, you will surely be right. And I took that to heart. And at that point, I had been about to go to medical school. I'd been a transformation coach for a decade, but I've been doing it pro bono. And now it's like, all right, I want to take this to this next chapter of my life. And I applied to the school in Arizona. Never been there before. And I remember flying over there. Didn't know how hot it gets. <laughs> 126 degrees, middle of the summer. I'm wearing a wool blazer. <laughs> and uh, I remember coming into the interview sweating profusely. And the president's wife in the school was like, you sure you don't want to take the blazer off? And I was like, no, no, it's OK. Just trying to save face, trying to be tough, I guess. And uh, I knew, though, when I got there, this was exactly where I was supposed to be. Fell in love with it right from the moment I stepped foot on the property and completed my four-year degree there and continued my coaching, started helping clients all around the world, started making videos and seeing the profound impact it was having, getting all these beautiful messages from around the world, people saying, that changed my life, that turned my day around, that saved my relationship, thank you so much. Then I turned it into a business. And that has been where my heart and soul is. For nearly two decades now, it's been my passion, my mission, and my purpose to be able to help leaders live extraordinary lives without regret. And I say leaders because I define a leader as a person who's committed to doing whatever it takes to get what they want in their life. And it's not just for them. They're serving a larger audience. They're serving a family. They're serving a community. And a leader is also somebody who impacts other people. So if I can impact a leader, they impact others. They impact others. And we make this world a much better place. And I remember just thinking about it and thinking, OK, how do I want to help people? What do I define as that extraordinary life without regret? And to me, it's, an, it's a life of vibrant health, passionate relationships, massive success on your terms, and lasting fulfillment. And how do I make it so I can remind you of who you truly are? Because most of us are living a story. We're living this false narrative based on what other people told us. Because for most of us, we wear a mask. We walk around life, our lives, and the last time we were truly ourselves is when we were children until we learned about shame, about insecurity, about who do I need to be for you to love me? Who do I need to be to be validated, to feel important, to feel special? And then we live someone else's version of our life to fit in. And we don't realize why that is one of the primary reasons why we're not happy. Because we're not living our life, we're living someone else's version of our life. So I've partnered with my clients, my family, my friends, anyone who comes to me looking for help, to help them in those four pillars. And once I can get the light switch to go off and remind them, reconnect them to their truth, 
They're able to serve the world in their unique way. And I've been blessed at this point to work with entrepreneurs, people in the military, professionals, athletes, even people who just say, look, my marriage is falling apart. I need some help. And we have this conversation. We master their communication. And all of a sudden, life's going well. And you know, this is my truth. This is my story. And I know you have got a story, too. And I'd love to hear from it. I'd love to hear from you. Please message me. I love hearing about what people have overcome in their life. I love hearing about how you got to this point. So definitely let me know. And hopefully one day we can meet, whether in one-on-one -on -one coaching, if I can serve you in any way, or whether it's at one of my live events, one of my community talks, whatever it is, I'd love to serve you in that way. I wish you the best, and I'll talk to you soon. Take care.